Bibles, well, to Genesis chapter 1, and we will get into it after I pray. Father, we thank you for being our God, and we thank you for being faithful, for being just and true. We thank you for being good. We ask, Father, that you would have your way with us, in us, and through us, that you would reveal to us who you are through your word, that your scriptures, Lord, would transform and change us, that as we hear the truth of what you have for us, that we would want to be more like you, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would grace us with your presence this evening, that you would remove me out of my own way, remove me out of your way. Would you be the teacher, Lord? We ask that your will be done. Amen. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'eretz. Bereshit ahat ahat. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. This is easily one of the most overlooked books in all of the Bible. When we think of Genesis, you know, most people don't think much of it. It's just like this kind of fairy tale telling of, of what God did and it helps those who believe God to suffice their need for a creation. But for those who are sophisticated, for those who have been enlightened, for those who have entered into the era of the science, the science is, we look at this and we say, we can explain all these little things away. Well, in the beginning there was nothing. And nothing exploded and everything came into being through that nothing. <laughs> now, you know, if, if you have half a brain, you would know that nothing can't create nothing. Nothing can't create anything. Nothing is nothing. Nothing isn't something. Nothing is the absence of something. Nothing in and of itself is exactly what it is. It's nothing. Nothingness. If you look in my palm here, I hold nothing. Well, actually, that's not true. Technically, I, I, there's, there's atoms and there's things here. True nothingness is nothing. There's, it's just non-existent. And non-existence can't bring existence into being because it decided it wanted to exist. Because for it to decide it wants to exist, there has to be something. When we look at Genesis chapter 1, we come to the one, one of the most, again, incredible portions of Scripture because... We see where everything starts. You heard me quote Genesis 1 in the Hebrew, and that word Bereshit is what, that's Genesis, and it means beginnings or origins. That's what it means. When we look at the first five books of Moses, it's called the Pentateuch. Penta, it's a Latin word. It means five. Penta, like a pentagram. So the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are five books that were penned by Moses. And that's accepted widely throughout scripture they'll often refer it to it as the law of moses when the law the, the law of moses is mentioned it's referring to one of these five books and when we look at these five books these five books are incredibly important because this is going to show us the beginnings of humanity the beginnings of creation humanity marriage sin redemption israel the patriarchs we're going to see the beginnings of all these things. And this starts here in Genesis. These are these beginnings. Now, it's good for us to know these beginnings because this tells us who we are, what we come from, where we come from, and where we're going. When we look at Genesis, the book alone covers approximately 2,500 years from chapter 1 to chapter 50. Now, 1,500 to 2,000 of those years are Genesis 1 through 11. That's, that's covered in just that right there. And when we get to chapter 12, we're, we're going to see this immense slowdown. When we get to the life of Abraham, things really come to a halt. And then we trail through the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that, that's covering the rest of Genesis. But these first 11 chapters are extremely important, and they're by far some of the most debated chapters that are the most skepticized chapter there's the, the, some of those chapters that most skeptics attack most if I said that right that doesn't sound right the way I said it but they're the most attacked by skeptics that's what I'm trying to say particularly because these first 11 chapters we don't have a lot of information about because as we're gonna see when we get to Genesis chapter 6 we're gonna see God has had it with mankind 
And God is going to do something to mankind unheard of. And he's going to destroy the world. He's going to rid the world of mankind and all of creation. He's going to completely just wipe it away and start fresh. With eight human beings, Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. And then two of every dirty animal and seven of every clean. We'll see that. So anything after chapter 8, 9, or anything prior to that, there is nothing that we have in history that can really give us good answers. So when we think of things like the dinosaurs, they likely took place in this era. They may have existed afterwards also. You'll see why here in a moment. But again, I want to jump back to this authorship. This authorship is Moses, and it was unanimously accepted as Moses as the author until about 300 years ago. Around 300 years ago was the Age of Enlightenment, and particularly as in Europe, you know, France, all these great places where it took place, place where atheism really started to bloom. And the idea of God became this nonsensical idea, and reason became the new God. And to this day, reason is still the God of many who refuse to believe in a literal God. They'll try to explain away creation, God. They'll try to explain away like things like the atom, things that are inexplainable, they'll explain them away with sciences and even unexplainable sciences. When we look at the atom, for example, I just mentioned that, it's held together by a nucleus that has negative and positive charged particles on the inside. And these particles, by nature's law, shouldn't exist. So you have this nucleus that's neutral, you have these negative par uh, charged particles, these positive charged particles. Now, have you, have you guys ever taken a negative and a positive battery, the nine volts? What happens, or, or let's use magnets, I shouldn't use the batteries. Magnets, you have the negative and the positive charged sides, right? So when you stick a negative to a positive, what happens? <laughs> and if the magnet's really strong, you're not pulling it apart. Now, if you take the positive and the positive and you try to stick them together, what do they do? And if you got a really strong magnet, you can't even get them very close at all because they just... If you take the negative and the negative and you try to... What do they do? They repel. And so this law of nature is established throughout nature. That's partly like why we see lightning and thunder because when the negative charged particles and the positives come... You see flashes of light. That's an explosion taking place. Well, the atom... The negative charged particles, the positive charged particles, they should do one of two things. The negatives and the positives should collapse, or the positives on the positives and the negatives on the negatives should repel and it should, it should explode. And they do neither. Rather, they sit in this perfect environment and atoms are made up of everything. Your skin, atoms. Those chairs, atoms. This granite t tabletop, atoms. These foam, everything has it's atoms they're in and on everything all of creation exists of that atom it's in everything on everything and you know what happens when you split an atom it's, it's called an atomic bomb that's what happens with an atomic bomb they put the the, 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 the I can't remember I should have wrote down the name of the chemical they drop in it um, radium whatever it is they drop the chemical into the bomb and when it mixes with the other chemical they have inside, the atom becomes unstable and it splits and it crazes, creates an atomic explosion. <coughs> and depending on how big that bomb is, we're looking, you know, we look at Nagasaki and Hiroshima and they were massive. They wiped out cities. And we have bombs today that could wipe out countries. Like the bombs are incredible that we've created. Science tries to explain God away with these things, but if you were to ask a scientist or an atheist, how is it that the atom exists how doesn't it repel or how isn't it that it collapses and they can tell you i don't know they actually i i have read one answer they say that there is an invisible force that holds it together they're right in first class in colossians 1 15 it says jesus holds all things together however cliche that might sound it's better than what they got. They say invisibleness holds it together. There's, there's an invisible string that we can't see that holds it together. We say, yeah, that's Jesus. Colossians 1.15 said 2,000 years ago, he holds it together. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Oh, little Judah's over there crying. What's wrong? It's okay. It's okay. You're cold? Are you guys all cold? You're sitting right under the vent too. You can turn it up like one or two degrees. 
Not too much though, because I'm fat. I get hot fast. It's on that back side of the wall. You could put it like 72. Oh, okay. At the house. Put it like 70. It's on 70? It's on 70, yeah. Okay, you could put it on 72. And the next time you're going to have to bring a sweater. Because I'm fat. I get hot. <laughs> but since the rise of the sciences and the, these arts, reason has become the new god of this age and people want to reason away god and do you want to know why people want to reason god away and it's not because there's not evidence for god the fact is there is so much evidence for god it's ridiculous you would think that most scientists are atheists right but what i've come to conclude i've found that most scientists are theists and theist is a, it's a greek word that means god theism is god the belief in God. Most scientists aren't necessarily Christians, but they are theists. And they believe in a God because when a true scientist looks at the natural order of creation, it's impossible to come to the conclusion that it was accidental. Because everything is so perfect and so finely tuned that for this to be an accident, it would be akin to this. Imagine I said there is a place in Kentucky that you can go and once a day, a tornado blows through their junkyard and once a day the tornado we don't know what it's gonna pick but once a day the tornado picks a car and it assembles the car as it blows through and it gets all the right parts all the right serial numbers it gets brand new paint slapped on a brand new upholstery the engine works perfectly and it spits it out and and it lands one day it's a Ferrari the next day it's a BMW one of one of the days it, it, it's an Escalade another day we got a Bentley and a Rolls Royce one day it's a Honda. We never know what's, what, what the tornado is going to pick. Just every day it blows through and it just arr, picks up a bunch of junk cars and it spits out a brand new shiny car with zero miles, full tank of gas, fresh oil and all. And it works perfectly. And every part, it coincides. Every single serial number matches on the whole car. Brand new tires. What would you say to that? You had to say you're stupid. <laughs> to, to, you, you, would, you would advocate for a mental institution because nobody in their right mind would say that was logical. And I'm here to tell you that that's more plausible than the theory that nothing exploded and out of it came the intricacies of life. And it's not just humanity. We look at the animals. We look at the plants. We look at our own solar system. We look at Earth. Did you know Earth sits at such a perfect distance from the sun that we don't freeze? And Earth sits at such a perfect distance from the sun that we don't burn up either. And Earth sits at such a perfect axis, I think it's 33 in the third degree axis, that we get all four seasons. Well, most everybody, not everybody, those on the equator are always tropical, but for the most of the part, Earth gets all four. Did you know if Earth sat on a different axis, half the Earth would freeze and the other half wouldn't? If it was just 100 miles closer, it would burn. 100 miles further, we'd freeze. It's incredible to think that this is so perfectly habitable for life that the ratio for carbon dioxide being transferred into oxygen by the plants is so much so that we're able to breathe and live. That we have, uh, our hydraulic system has enough water to sustain us. Our bodies are 76.5% water, something of that nature. Did, did you know the odds of that? Any scientist would look at that and say you'd be a fool to think it was an accident. So why is it that those who advocate for reason reject God? And it's simple. I'm going to tell you why. If you guys really want to, have you ever talked to somebody who says they don't believe in God? Do you want to know why they don't believe in God? Why, why do you think? Oh, because... You raised your hand, so... Well, I know. I'm talking to somebody. Oh, but. <laughs> oh. I'm going to tell you why. When you're dealing with somebody, it's not about facts. You can give them all the facts. I've talked to people. I got facts. I got facts for days. The fact, fact, fact. The reason people reject Jesus is simple. It's because they don't want to be held accountable for their sin. That's it. They want to live life the way they want to live and not feel bad about it. They want to maintain their sin and have some kind of superficial hope that, well, if I just, if I don't go, well, then I can't be held accountable. But everybody will be held accountable. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is probably one of the heaviest verses in all of Scripture. Has anybody in here ever had trouble believing or even just taking in the concept that God has raised somebody from the dead? I'll be honest with you, I, I have. It sounds like 
impossible, right? How can somebody raise from the dead? Or how about when Jesus heals somebody? Has anybody ever had trouble believing that? Like, well, how did he just heal somebody's withered arm? How did he put Malchus's ear back on his head? How did he make a paralyzed man walk again, right? I mean, those are some pretty heavy things to believe in. But I'm here to tell you, if you can get past Genesis 1-1, the rest of the Bible is easy. Some people, I can't believe, how can God tell the future? If you can get past chapter 1, verse 1 of the Bible, everything else is easy. If you can believe in the beginning, God created everything with the breath of his mouth then nothing is too hard for God. As a matter of fact, in light of Genesis 1-1, every problem you've ever encountered is minuscule in comparison. Do you guys ever stress out about your issues and your problems? How small must those problems be to a God who can create everything in existence with the spoken word of his mouth? And that same God who did that calls you his child if you're born again. How incredible is that, right? And all of a sudden, our big problems that we face daily, that, oh, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, they become these tiny little molehills. You've heard that saying, don't make a molehill a mountain. In the sight of God, every major problem is nothing but a molehill. When it says in the beginning, God, this Hebrew word for God is the Hebrew word Elohim. This is a very, I wrote it down because I don't want to say it wrong. It's a common Hebrew word, and it means gods. El is the singular form of Elohim, and El means God. When you put the I am on the Hebrew word Elohim, and it, it, it makes it plural. And in the Hebrew, it's Bereshit bara Elohim. Literally, in the beginning was nothing gods created. Now, if you were to ask a Jew why this is plural, they would tell you, we don't know. But that's what the scrolls say. And those who say, well, the scrolls can't be trusted. The truth is, we have scrolls from the Bible that predate Jesus. We have a scroll of the book of Isaiah that dates back to 300 BC that was found in the caves of Qumran back in 1947. And it's dated, and we, we have the scroll of Isaiah. You want to know what the most incredible thing about the scroll of Isaiah is that they found? It's not what they found, it's what they didn't find. Mistakes. When they translated that scroll of Isaiah that's 300 years older than Jesus, it's word for word the same as the Isaiah that sits in your Bible today. So when people say that the Bible's been mistranslated and reiterated and blah, 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 no, they ha it hasn't. They don't understand the lengthy process that scribes went through over the centuries to make sure that the Word of God wasn't tainted. It was, you couldn't just be a scribe. You had to be trained since a child to be a scribe. And you went through several years, we're talking a decade and a half of training before you were allowed to pick up a pen to start transcribing the Word of God or to start scribing it and making copies. And this is how strict the copy making process was for a scribe. And in Israel, they still do this today. I've seen scribes transcri uh, scripting scrolls because they still deal with scrolls in the Hebrew text in Israel. This is how strict it is. If you put one dot out of place, they take the scroll, they rip it up, they burn it, and you have to start over. If one dot, if one period, if one, any, if it's just out of place, it's no good. This process has been taking place for several thousand years before even Jesus was here. So it says Elohim here. Does anybody have an idea why it would say Elohim? Why would God be pronounced as a plural in the Hebrew? I'm going to tell you why. Because for the Christian, we believe God is one. Right? Would anybody disagree with God is one? There's only one God. There is. There is only one God. But God exists in three separate and distinct persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not necessarily three gods. It's one God, three persons. Don't think of God as a person. Think of God as a title. It's like marriage. Marriage is a title. Now, in marriage, I have my wife and myself. Two persons make marriage what it is. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit make God who He is. And so this pluralism here for God or gods is literally the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God. And we see the Spirit in verse 2 hovering over the surface of the deep. 
And we're going to see later on more evidence that gives credit to this triune nature of God. The Trinity is something that we don't budge on as Christians. There are those out there who are called, who are called Unitarianists. Uni meaning one. Terian, Unitarian, they believe God is one and only one. There is no Father, Son. They believe Jesus is the Father, the Spirit is Father, the Father is the Father. It's just the Father showing up in different forms. They don't believe God exists in three persons. Now I have a major problem with that because in John chapter 17, verse 5, Jesus speaking to the Father says, Glorify me again with you so that I can be glorified with the position that I had before the world was. Jesus talks to the Holy Spirit as a separate, distinct person. He talks to the Father as a separate, distinct person. He refers to himself as a separate, distinct person. Therefore, we can conclude that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are separate and distinct persons. Now, this is the phraseology that I would encourage you to learn when it comes to the Trinity. Within the nature of the one true God exist set three separate and distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the best definition you'll ever hear of the Trinity. And the Bible substantiates the Trinity in and through, and it's solid and clear-cut. The word Trinity might not be used in the Bible, but the word Bible isn't used in the Bible either. The word Jesus isn't in the Bible either. It's actually the Hebrew name Yeshua, or the Greek name Jesus. So just because it's not in the Bible, doesn't mean the concept isn't in the Bible. The concept is there. It's Rapture actually is in the Bible. It's in the Latin, Raptura. We, we've, we've gone over that at nauseum. But it's not in the English Bible. So just because it doesn't show up the way we want it to, doesn't make it any less truth. Now when it says here, in the beginning, this is an extremely heavy phrase. Because... When we talk about the beginning, we have to now presuppose something predates the beginning. And something does predate the beginning. It's God. When God brought everything into being, this is called the continuum. It's actually called the space-time continuum. It's where space, time, and matter come into being. And what we have concluded through science is that space, time, and matter consist simultaneously they don't they don't exist separate from each other as far as science knows there is no point in time ever where time space or matter didn't exist together and it's called the continuum it continues always will always will be this always was and always will be is what i meant to say it's called the continuum and that's a very important thing to, 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 to take a stance on. Now listen to what this evolutionary philosopher Herbert Spencer says. He was one of Darwin's earliest and most enthusiastic advocates. He outlined five ultimate scientific ideas, five manifestations of natural phenomenon that are necessary for existence. Time, force, action, space, and matter. Now he was an atheist. He was a, an advocate of evolutionism. But he says even in the sciences, they agree that these five manifestations must be evident and present for this world to exist as is. Let's see. I'm going to just quote Albert Einstein's teacher, Herman Minkowski. He says this, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows and only a kind of union of the two will, pres will preserve an independent reality. Again, stating that they cannot exist separately, but they must coexist and always exist together. I keep dropping things down. With these five manifestations, we see time, force, action, space, and matter. Listen to Genesis 1 again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, in the beginning, that's a timestamp. God, that's a force, created, that's an action. The heavens, that's a space. And the earth, that's matter. These five manifestations are present in the very first verse of the Bible. And the evolutionary sciences would say that these five manifestations are necessary in order for existence to be. And we see it right here in the very first verse. Again, this first verse is such a heavy-weighted verse. To, to skip past it would be foolish on our part, I believe. For time to come into being, that means God must exist outside of time. All of us have phones, right? You know, some of us have Androids, other of us have Apple, other of us have whatever you have, Sony or Samsung or whatever, we'll just call them androids, I believe they're all android based. 
Now somebody created these phones. They have a manufacturer. The thing about creating something is the creator must exist outside of that creation, right? It must be, it must be able to function outside of it. So when we pick up our phones and we work our phones and we use our phones and we're looking at our phones, we don't have Steve Jobs running around in there poking a little. No, he created a system that operates as we use it, as we touch it, and it does what we tell it to do. But Steve Jobs himself isn't in there. He lives independent of his creation. As God lives independent of his creation. So time, force, space, matter. So time, space, continuum. God's not affected by the time, space, continuum. Which means God exists outside of time. He's eternal. That is the truest definition of eternal. It's timelessness. There's no beginning and no end. We view and understand time as consecutive moments moving forward, right? Everything we measure and gauge is from one point, point A, to another point, point B, to point C. And it only goes forward. We can't go backwards on the time scale, right? We measure, right now it's, I don't know if that clock is right, it says 752. I gotta put new batteries in it because it's is that 754. I'm off. 754 is what my iPad says. In six minutes, it's gonna be eight o'clock. Time is only moving forward for us. Where God exists, time doesn't exist. He exists outside of time. It's why in Isaiah chapter I wrote it down chapter 46 verse 10 it says God declares the beginning from the end. God can tell us what's going to happen before it happens because he's not bound by time and space as we are. It's why the Bible says that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. That means before God laid, before God did Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, before God did any of this, the lamb was already slain in his books. Jesus already chose to come down and die for the sin of the world. God already has a record of everything that has happened and will happen. Now, we don't exist outside of time. So for us, we still have choice. So that brings a whole nother view in that we're not going to get into for time's sake because I want to finish chapter one. But God exists independent of time, space, and matter. So God can tell us what's coming before it comes and have an exact, accurate scape and scope of what's going to happen. And he can give us detailed accounts of exactly how it'll happen. And he doesn't make it happen. He just can see it happening because he exists separate from it. It's kind of like if you watch a game, right? Have you ever watched a game beforehand? And then you have another friend who goes back and they recorded it on their DVR because they had to work or something. You can walk to your friend and you can tell them everything that's going to happen in that game and you'll have precise, accurate assessment because you've already seen the game take place. That's how it is with God. He's already watched it all happen because from where he exists, it's all done. Everything's a done deal. Now, I'm going to go forward because we still have a lot to cover. Now, when we get into chapter 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, between Genesis 1 and uh, 1, 1 and 1, 2, there's what's known as the gap theory. Now, the gap theory are these people who have come up with this theory that between Genesis 1, 1 verse 1 in Genesis 1 verse 2 that there's millions of years and they say between verse 1 and verse 2 a cataclysmic event took place it's when the angels rebelled now this is I don't believe this is true at all realize that they believe this is where the angels fell this is how the earth became formless and void and they'll substantiate it because they'll take a verse out of Isaiah they'll take it out of Isaiah I hope I wrote it down I believe he did Isaiah 45 18 and Isaiah writes God did not create the world to be a waste place and they'll say <gasps> look what verse 2 says and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. It was formless and void. It was a waste place. But God didn't create it to be a waste place. Therefore, between verse 1 and verse 2, millions of years must have happened there. And that now explains why the earth looks 5 billion years old, 13 billion, however billion it is. It changes. It varies every time I hear somebody talking. I've heard 20 billion. I've lots of billions in there. But they'll say it happened here in verse between verse 1 and verse 2. It's called the gap there. There's a big gap between verse 1 and verse 2. And... Again, for those who want to believe in Jesus and also hold to this, uh, the gap theory, then they believe that this took place. Now, I believe that's a bunch of garbage. When Isaiah 45 says God didn't create the world a waste place, Genesis verse uh, chapter 1 verse 2 doesn't state that it was a waste place at all. 
What it tells us is God is in the process of creation. As we go through chapter 1, we're going to see God didn't create it to be a waste place. He's going to create a very lush, healthy, thriving environment. We're just not there yet. We're just in the beginnings of creation. Now, has anybody in here ever like drew something and somebody walks up to see what you're drawing and you're just starting out? You're maybe just like a quarter of the way through and they look and like, what are you doing? That looks stupid. I like to, I'm a barber. And when I cut hair, there's nothing that bothers me more than when people watch me cut their hair. Because when they watch, they, they, they see me halfway through and it looks like it's all jacked up. Because there's a big old line on their head. Because I haven't faded the line out yet. I'm not there. And so I, I used to get mad. People would start getting free. And I can tell the look on their face. And I'd be like, dude, you need to knock that look off. I'm going to bald you. <laughs> Tr I trust me. I know what I'm doing. I just, I'm three minutes into the haircut. Give me 15 or 20 minutes and I promise you'll be good. Like, but when you just look at the beginnings of the work, it looks unfinished and jacked up. God just started the work. The gap theory, in essence, is garbage. Don't fall into that kind of a nonsense. There is no reason to believe that there is any kind of gap between verse 1 and verse 2. There's none whatsoever. So for those that, uh, that take that stance, it oh, sucks to be you. <laughs> There's no way to prove that. Now, I guess one of the questions that we should ask is, well, then why does the earth look five billion years old? If we were to trace the lineage of Adam to today, we're almost around 6,000 years. That's what it is. If you trace the, if the Bible really is right, and it really is the word of God, and we trace the lineage of, lineage of Adam, we're like year 5,998, something like that. We're almost at 6,000 years, somewhere around there. I believe the earth is only 6,000 years old. So why does it look 5 billion years old? We're going to get to verse 26 and God is going to create man. And when he creates man, Adam comes forth. When Adam comes forth, he doesn't come forth as a baby. He comes forth as a fully grown man. So although Adam will be one day old, he's going to look like maybe me, a grown man in his prime full of intelligence and health how can this be while the God who can create with the breath of his mouth it creates with age so it's not a hard thing to believe that God creates an earth that looks six billion years old and it's only six thousand years old it's not a hard thing to believe God creates with age when God brings forth Eve from Adam's side he doesn't bring Adam a baby and say raise this baby and one day you'll marry her no, he brings a full-fledged woman. She's fully developed and full of reason and intelligence. God creates with age. When it says here that the spirit was hovering over the surface of the deep, moving over the surface of the waters, this again shows that God exists in several persons. Because we see here the distinction of the Spirit of God. And when we get to verse 26, we're going to see God speaking to himself. He's going to say, let us make man in our image. We'll get there. Let's get into verse 3 because, again, we've got a lot to cover. And we're going to go through verses 3 through about 24, 25 at a much more rapid pace. Because verse 1 really is where a lot of that weight sits. So as we get into verse 3, it says, Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. When the Bible says, let there be light, the Hebrew literally says, light be and light was. Again, God creates with speech. These are the first recorded words of God, by the way, in the Bible. Light be and light was. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Excuse me. God saw that the light was good, and that light separates from the darkness. Now, does anybody know what darkness is? It's the absence of light. That's what it is. So it's not only that it separates from the darkness, it's where darkness is, it's the absence of light. And there is some spiritual, spiritual truth in this. Because the Bible says, where light is, darkness cannot be. And light and darkness, have they have no cohabitation. They can't exist together. And it's one of the reasons the Bible tells us as believers, we're not to cohabit with unbelievers. Because what union has darkness and light? It has none. If we were to shut off all the lights, the light, the, the light would flee and the darkness would, rest, it would settle in. And the second we flick the lights on, the darkness flees. 
because darkness is the absence of light. Now, interesting, the sun won't be created until the fourth day, I believe. So where is this light coming from? Many believe that this light is the Shekinah glory of God. When we get to Revelation, I think it's chapter, we taught it recently. We're not going to go there for a while because that was a, about a year of teaching. And when we got to the end of Revelation, when God and his people are in the throne room of heaven and we're worshiping for eternity, it says there is no more need for sun or moon or stars for God himself will illuminate the new heavens and the new earth. God himself lights the new heavens and the earth. And we believe it's that Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory, it's, it's the glory of God that burns bright. So when we, when we get into the book of the kings and Solomon becomes king and they build the tabernacle, the, God, the, the, the glory of God settles in and it's so bright they just fall on their faces and they worship. And it's this brightness that accompanies God's presence. It's the glory of God. Now we believe that's what this light is because there is no other light in existence at this point. The sun isn't there yet. The moon, stars, nothing's there yet. The moon's nothing without the sun anyway. But then it says evening and morning are one day. Now again, there are those who like to reason away the word of God because, you know, the earth's got to be billions of years old. So what they, they'll say is, well, the truth is with each day that God created, it was actually thousands of years. It wasn't an actual day. It was more like thousands of years because sometimes a day can mean a thousand years, right? The day of the Lord is like a thousand year period. It's this thousand year reigning of Christ as Messiah from Jerusalem. It's, we call it the millennial reign. So sometimes a day could be representative of a span of time. That would be ridiculous. I'm going I'm to tell you how I know it's a 24 hour period. Because here in verse, where is it? Four, I believe it is. No, verse 5. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. There was what? Evening and morning one day. That's a 24-hour period. And this is why the Jews celebrate their days evening in the morning. Evening in the morning. So when the evening comes in, their new day starts. So right now for the Jew, this wouldn't be Wednesday anymore. It would now be Thursday. It would be Thurs Thurs night. Thursday night. And then tomorrow would be Thursday for them. And then when the sun sets, it would be Friday night. And then Friday. And then when the sun sets, Saturday night. And then Saturday. And that's why they do it because of Genesis chapter 1 verse 5 here. Then in verse 6, uh, 6 through 10, it says, Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which, which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning, a second day. The expanse, some of your Bible translations say a firmament. And this is basically the space that separates the waters from the waters. Now, I guess the question would be, which waters? It says the waters below and the waters above. The waters below, this is what we call the rivers and the seas and the lakes and the things like that. And then it mentions these waters above. Now, there are many who believe, and I'm one of them, that there used to be an ice dome that encapsulated the earth. And that this ice dome was what was there prior to Noah's flood. Because in the Bible it says the waters came from above and from below. And many believe that this ice dome melted away and that's where the waters came from above and water shot forth from underneath the earth. And we'll see that when we get to chapter 6, 7 when we see the flood of Noah's day and so forth. But if this were so, if there were this ice dome that encapsulated the earth, something interesting would happen. Now all those harmful UVs that make our wrinkly skin, you know how you girls are always buying makeup to get rid of the wrinkles. You buy those special makeup so you don't have bags under your eyes because you want to look pretty for your man, right? And you know why you, your face wrinkles up the way it does and why our skin turns leathery and nasty? It's because of the harmful UV of the sun. It's why your lotions have UV protection and we put the UV, uh, the, the suntan lotion on to protect our skin because those UVs are really harmful to our skin. And they age us and they actually kill us quicker. That's why people get all up in arms about our atmosphere, the ozone layer. Remember when I was a kid, the ozone layer was like the detriment of life. Yeah, you don't tell farts and spray paints and blah, blah, blah. Now it's the, the, the global warming, which again is part of that, that ozone layer burning away. Well, if this ice capsule encapsulated the earth, those harmful UVs wouldn't come through. We'd get nothing but pure sunlight through that. 
Yes, the sunlight would still go through. It's kind of like a magnifying glass or, you know, you can take ice and the light can still come through. And it would actually make an environment of the earth that would be very tropical worldwide. The pressure would be about double what it is now and oxygen rests at about 21%. They believe oxygen would have been about double, maybe more than double, up to 50% of that. Now, what does that mean? Dr. Kimori, a Japanese scientist, I didn't mention his college, you can look him up yourself. He created what's known as a hyperbaric chamber. And he planted a cherry tomato plant in this hyperbaric chamber to do a test. And what he did is this hyperbaric chamber, it was pressurized and the oxygen saturation was double that of what we breathe. Now, the typical cherry tomato plant, I believe that lives for about six months and then it'll die off. And it'll produce a number of little cherry tomatoes and it's cool. Well, he put one in this hyperbaric chamber and he put this, these special plastics that blocked out the UVs and allowed nothing but natural pure sunlight to come through. And within six months, this plant grew to be 15 feet tall. Within, I believe, the year, it grew over three stories, over 30 feet tall. Lasted more than two years and put out more than... 13,000 cherry tomatoes, which they said were the size of baseballs because of the pressurization and the oxygen saturation. I didn't get all the stats, but I, I was listening to this, this professor speak about this young girl who had had something traumatic happen to her leg. She fell into something and her leg turned black from lack of blood flow. And they were the, one of the doctors was going to cut off her leg. I, I should have verified this, but I didn't. I was just super busy this whole week. And as this doctor was getting ready to prepare the family to say, hey, we have to amputate this little girl's leg, it was black, by the way, from lack of blood flow and oxygen. Remember, our blood brings oxygen to our body, which keeps it alive. Oxygen is necessary throughout our body. Well, one of the doctors said, let's try something before we just chop this little girl's leg off. Let's put her in one of these hyperbaric chambers. Let's basically pump up the H2O saturation and let's see what it does. And they said within six hours, her leg turned pink. And after, I think it was like 24 hours, the only thing that wouldn't turn back was half of her little pinky toe. And they ended up having to amputate that. But basically brought her leg back. I say that because when we read Genesis, one of the reasons people have such a hard time believing it is because we see people living like 900 years. And it's like, wow, that's impossible. But is it? I was listening, listening to the same professor speak. His name's Ket Hovind. And he was saying that they've found air bubbles in tree sap. Like, you know, they find mosquitoes and things. And they say that when they've pulled some of that air out, they found that the oxygen saturation was double that of what we breathe today. And the result of that would be people would live much longer. They'd be healthier, more intelligent. Because the more oxygen you get to the brain, the better it functions. The stronger you become, the longer you live, the healthier you'll, become, you'll be. It doesn't blow my, it doesn't actually shock me to think that because when we get to the millennial reign, when Jesus reigns and rules for a thousand years in Jerusalem, Isaiah talks about that time period and I think it's like chapter 65. And he says, and don't quote me on the chapter, but it's in Isaiah for sure. It's in the last six chapters of Isaiah. He says, those who die at a hundred in that time period will be considered as infants. Infants. Well, I guess if you live to be 900 years, if you die at 100, you would be considered like an infant, right? And so we believe that because of this waters above, the high pressure of the earth and the rich saturation of the, of the O2, that people lived longer, much longer, healthier, probably smarter. I know we like to think of the earliest men as Neanderthals and stupid, but I can't imagine that the closer you get to God, the stupider you become. I just, I, I can't picture that. I'd imagine Adam was extremely intelligent. Well, they didn't have electricity. We don't know that. We just assume they didn't have these things. I don't know what they had then. I do know that Adam named everything. All the animals that we have today, he named them. And again, I would imagine that the closer you get to God, the more intelligent you are. As a matter of fact, when you look at the ancient civilizations, the, the intelligence of these civilizations is mind-boggling, what some of these people did. To this day, we still can't replicate the pyramids of Egypt can't be done we can't rebuild them they're, they're, we are baffled we look at things like if you go to Israel and you see the temple of Solomon and you look at the blocks they laid we don't know how they lifted them because we don't have cranes today that can lift those blocks we're talking 
15 feet high, 30 feet long, 15 feet wide. We don't have a crane today that can lift that. And so we wondered, how do they get these things built? Again, we like to think that the ancients are stupid, but I'd imagine the closer you get to God, the more intelligent they are. And when you get into the pyramids, it's a whole other ball game we're not going to, though. So these waters were separated. In verse 9, Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Now the waters gathered into one place. There are those who believe that the waters used to be separated from the lands as far as there was one land mass, and then there was the waters. Now we, you know, we have land here, land there. The waters separate the lands. And, and many believe that when Noah's, the, 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 the catastrophe of Noah's day happened, that that land mass split up and it forms today what we see on the geographical map. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I do find it interesting when we look at today's map, it almost looks like a puzzle piece. And if you were to take all these land masses and it almost looks like they'd come together as one. Now, I'm not saying that they do or would. I don't know. What I'm saying is I find that really interesting. But, that being said, the waters were separated into one place. Let the dry land appear, and it was so. Verse 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation. We're now at day three. Plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a third day. Now vegetation comes forth, and this is imperative for us, because what vegetation does is it takes that CO2, that carbon dioxide, that nasty stuff that we breathe out, that cars spit out, and plants suck that in, and spit out clean O2 for us to breathe. <sighs> vegetation is extremely important. Now, the Bible mentions something here that's worth knowing. It says that there are fruit trees and seeds and trees after their kind. Now, this is an issue for the evolutionist and for a good reason because evolution believes that you can jump up and down the DNA scale. What that means is they believe that Cats can become dogs. That fish can become humans. If you throw a cat in the water long enough, it'll become a catfish. <laughs> that's essentially what they believe. Now, they probably would never say that, but that, that's evolutionism, right? They're going to change according to what they're, where they're at. They, they, they'll have the ability to even jump species. But the truth is that's impossible because that cat would long drown before it ever had a chance to mutate. Even the primordial soup that was struck, how did it get stepped on before it transformed into us? And then how did it split apart to make millions of us? It's impossible. There's no jumping up and down the DNA scale. In the 1880s, a man by the name of Judge James Harvey Logan crossbred a blackberry with a red raspberry and created what's known as a Loganberry. And the scientific community went crazy. <gasps> Evolution! We finally were able to prove it. We crossbred two berries and made a new berry. Evolution at its finest. And so those who believe in God looked at that and said, Wow, you're foolish. It's still a berry. It's still part of the berry family. It's like if you took a terrier and you took, I don't know what pit bulls are married, made of, I know it's terrier, but if you took one of the dogs that make a pit bull and one of the dogs that's a terrier and you bred them and it makes now what we call a pit bull, it's not like it's, it didn't become a cat or a moose. It's still a dog. It's still part of the canine family. That DNA still is intact for canine. If you draw its blood, it's still a dog. Lions and tigers. I, I, I was arguing with an atheist once, and he said that there's, ev there's evidence for evolution. And he said, a lion and a tiger bred, and it became, a liger came out. Evolution. I said, it's still a feline. Now, if the lion and tiger bred and a wolf popped out, we could have a conversation. You know, you got my attention there. You throw a human in the water long enough, if it sprouts gills, we can talk. But it'll never happen. Because we can't jump up and down the DNA scale. We can come across, we can adapt, but we can't mutate to become something different. We are what our DNA says we are, and that's it. A cat will always be a cat. A dog will always be a dog. This day, we're even trying to jump within our species. Men are trying to become women, and women are trying to become men. And even then, that's impossible. 
I mean, to truly become, a, for a man to become a woman, you'd have to take his soul out of his body and stick it in the body of a woman. <laughs> That's the only way it ever, no matter what he does, no matter how many surgeries he has, his chromosomes will always read XY. So what it, it will always read XY, no matter what. That's male chromosomes. His bone structure will always have the density of a male. His diaphragm, his muscular structure, it's always going to read as a male because he is biologically a male. The only way for a man to truly become a woman is again, you got to remove the soul and stick it in a female's body. Then he would legitimately be a woman. But at that point, he would no longer be a he. She would be a she. Now, some people get a little weirded out when I say this, but I personally believe in evolution. And let me explain what I mean when I say that. I don't believe in macro evolution. Macro evolution is when you jump up and down the DNA scale. I or that micro evolution is that. I believe in macro evolution. So micro is cats can become dogs. Fish can become humans. Macro evolution is better pronounced adaptation. And the way I best describe this is when somebody moves here from California, it's harder for them to breathe because our, we, live, we rest at a higher altitude, which means the air is denser. And when somebody moves here from California, they get winded a little, a little faster. But the longer they stay in New Mexico, their body adapts to the dense air pressure. And before you know it, they're just like us. And they move and their, their lungs have adapted to this. They adapt. If somebody moves to a region that's hotter, their skin might ma maintain a darker color year-round because their body is going to adapt to where they're at. But they will never ch jump up and down the DNA scale. A can of soup will never become human. That's what they believe. Primordial soup or ooze was struck by lightning and humanity popped out. <laughs> I find that funny. Molecular biologist Michael Denton says this, as it was in Darwin's day, evolution is still a highly speculative hypothesis entirely without direct factual support. There is zero evidence to support it. In verse 14 it says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so... God made the two great lights, the greater, to, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the night, the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. God gave two lights, one to separate the day from the night, the stars and the moon for the night and the, our star for for the day of the sun, and it's really just the same, but it's making a distinction. And this is what gives in to that 24-hour period. Now again, the fact that the sun is created on the fourth day begs the question, well, where was the light coming from prior? Again, the glory of God is what we believe did that. Now the lights weren't just given for us to see. They were given for signs and for seasons. It says the stars and the moons were given for signs and for seasons. The Jewish calendar still operates on the lunar calendar. They celebrate their feasts and their things according to the lights of the stars and the moon and so forth. So Passover will always fall in a full moon. Always. It always will. And that's what it says. Verse 20 says, Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth in op the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day now god brings forth actual life the creatures of the sea and he says of these creatures of the sea they are to reproduce after their kind and to this day creatures can only reproduce after their kind a woman cannot get pregnant from an animal an animal cannot get pregnant from a human it's impossible 
It would never support. It's not habitable for that. The DNA structure would never take and suffice. Things can only reproduce after how God created them to reproduce. And it's after their kind. And that's one of those big things you want to stick to whenever you're dealing with somebody that is heavily influenced by evolution. Because no matter how far they try to take it, it'll only reproduce after its kind. Now, when you're looking at I'm not going to go. That was going to go somewhere, but I'm not going to. We're almost done, you guys. I think we started at 7.30, so I got eight minutes. Verse 24, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. God saw that it was good. Now this sixth day... God created all the beasts of the field. This would include dinosaurs. I often come across Christians that don't believe in dinosaurs because the Bible doesn't mention dinosaurs. I believe in dinosaurs. That's not a trick anything. I believe in them, and I'm going to tell you why I believe in dinosaurs. Because we have fossils of dinosaurs. I mean, period. What's well, a trick from the enemy, brother. No, it's not a trick from the enemy. We, the dinosaurs existed. Well, why doesn't the Bible talk about dinosaurs? Because dinosaurs is a term that was created in the, in the 1840s. It's only a little less than 200 years old, the term. What was it called prior to that? Beasts. Notice in creation day, God doesn't talk about lions. or I don't, I don't think rhino is mentioned in the Bible, is it? I don't think, uh, I don't think moles are mentioned in the Bible. I've never heard of a chipmunk in the Bible. You know, so do chipmunks not exist? Because I saw one the other day. I saw one yesterday when I was walking. Just because the Bible doesn't specify it and its terminology doesn't mean it, it didn't exist. They existed because we have fossil records of them. We know they existed. And they're not millions of years old. Dinosaurs are relatively young, within 6,000 years. There is a find of... Of, of a massive graveyard of dinosaur bones in Glen Rose, Texas at the Paluxy River and science, the science community was raving and ranting about it because it was so exciting. We can't believe we found these fossils and that's how it is whenever they find new fossils. And as they were continuing to excavate and dig into it, they found something that stumped them. They found another fossil that dated back to as old as those dinosaur bones and they were human footprints. <laughs> Now, they didn't want to talk about it much after that because that kind of puts a, a damper on the whole idea that these dinosaur fossils are millions of years old. Because they like to believe that the Cretaceous period was millions of years before the advent of man. But the truth is, man and beast have coexisted since day six of creation. Well, where are the dinosaurs? Many believe that the dinosaurs were killed off by a massive meteor. Which, maybe. There's no way to prove that. We have the creator. We know you don't know anything because you weren't there. We do know that there was rich saturation of oxygen in the early days of humanity, in the early first couple thousand years until Noah's flood came and that we, we believe that ice dome mount, melted. Now, one of the theories I heard and I liked was after the flood that the, the air pressure changed, which means that the dinosaurs that used to fly wouldn't be able to fly because the density of the air pressure would not be able to support their flight. Two, that they would have died off of lack of oxygen because they wouldn't have enough oxygen to support their ha their their hab. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, for them to live. I was gonna say habitat, but that's not the word I wanted to use. But and, and I really liked that. That would explain why they would have died off. There doesn't need to be some... Now, I like the cataclysmic things. I like to watch those shows because it's exciting to watch. But the truth is, there's nothing that can verify that fact. It's not a verifiable fact. It's a hypothesis. Pure hypothesis. There's no way to, to, to establish that as truth. Well, there's no way to establish yours either. No, but it makes more sense than yours. We can say, and there is evidence to support a global flood destroying the world. There isn't evidence to support that there was a cataclysmic event such as the one they proposed the dinosaurs died in. There's just not. There's a crater in the earth. That doesn't mean anything. That means nothing at all. As a matter of fact, when we get to ch ch chapter 6, we're, we're going to see there's great reasons for there to be holes in the earth. Because the earth split open. You'll see that when we get there. 
But this sixth day, this is when man was also created. In verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And when God said, Let us, there are those who propose, He was talking to the angels. And He said, Let us make man in our image, except God would never put an angel on par with Himself, ever. As a matter of fact, whenever humanity in the scriptures worships an angel, the angel has a message for that man. The message is, don't do that. I'm not God. I'm a servant like you. Get off your knees. Because oftentimes in angels appear in scripture, men in their stupidity fall down to worship the angel because, well, they're angels. And the angel will always discourage that and say, don't do that. So when God says, let us make Angels don't have creative powers either. God does though. So who is the us God is referring to? Again, this is a massive, massive reference to the triune nature of God. Tri meaning three, un meaning one, the three in one, the triune nature of God. Verse 27, God created man in his own image and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, Let us make man in our image. And he did. What is it to be made in the image of God? Does that mean that God's face looks like this? No, because the Bible says God is a spirit and he doesn't have a face. The image that the Bible speaks of, this likeness, it's in consciousness, in morality, it's in free will, and I believe, and I never said this before until I was studying this last week, and I believe in creative capabilities. The angels don't even have creative capabilities. We do. We can reproduce. The angels, I mean, well, we're going to see that the angels reproduce with humanity, but I don't believe the angels can reproduce with one another. We can create things, and the angels can't. But more so, we have a consciousness. We have the ability to worship. Unlike every other created thing that God has created, they just live and they are. Like, we all have dogs and cats, right? Has anybody ever come home to Scooby-Doo worshiping God? With their hands raised in there, what are you doing, Scoob? I'm worshiping Jesus. Dogs just, they're alive. They have intelligence, but they don't have the ability to reason within themselves. They're dogs. As a matter of fact, if you put a piece of meat before a dog, all reason goes out the window. You might be able to train a dog to sit until you tell them they're ready to grab the meat, but all reason is gone. They don't care about you. They don't even care about themselves. All they see and smell is meat. And don't believe me, do this. And they'll, they'll just follow that meat. They're just waiting for a command because you've trained them, you've conditioned them to wait till you tell them to go. The truth is all reason goes out once that dog sees and smells that food. It's game on. That dog will never say, God is good, isn't he? That is for humanity only. We have the ability to worship God, to reason within ourselves, to conclude. We have the ability to reject God. That's a crazy one, right? Animals can't do that. They're not that stupid. They're not that smart either. The seas even obey Jesus. We have the ability to reason within ourselves and say no. <laughs> That's crazy to think. But we are made in His likeness. And He gave us dominion over the whole earth. God gave us dominion to have authority over the birds and the seas and the creatures and so forth. And we have the ability to say, have you ever seen a human tame, uh, not Planet of the Apes? I'm saying in real life, have you ever seen a human tamed by a lion? Have you ever seen a lion put a human in a collar and whip him? No. A lion will eat a human. But humans have are the only ones with the capability to tame another species. We have dominion and the ability to do such things. Verse 29, Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be for food for you. And to every beast out of the earth, to every bird of the sky, to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, a sixth day. God gave dominion of the plants, the animals and all, and the plants and whatnot were for food. 
Now, animals didn't become food until after sin enters in. Because until sin enters in, death will not exist. So we'll see that when we get to chapter 3. We'll see the first animal die. But till then, it appears that the only food that man had is the food of the fruit of the trees and the seeds and so forth. Now, there's a little phrase, not a phrase, but there's something that God says here at the end that's really important to look at and we'll wrap it up. God saw that all that he had made and behold, it was very good. What was bad that God made? Nothing. Nothing. Everything was made in these six days. That means the, the plants that produce drugs... Weed, sex, everything. Because God created male and female, right? And they were to produce. These are all good things. You don't hear that often, right? I grew up thinking sex was bad and drugs are bad. And they can be bad. What makes these things bad? It's not them in and of themselves. In and of themselves, they're created to be good, very good. What makes them bad is our abuse and perversion of it. That's it. Drugs, try getting surgery without morphine or whatever it is they put you under with, without the gas. I'm going to bet that that's going to be a very unpleasant thing. Or how about post-surgery? Try it without the medications afterwards. Try living with strep throat without amoxicillin. It was way worse than COVID. I'll tell you right now, I'll take COVID over strep throat any day. The strep throat that I had anyway. I had COVID... And then right after COVID, I got strep. And I thought it was COVID again. I'm here to tell you that strep throat, I was pushing like a 104 degree temperature. I was getting hallucin. I was hallucinating. I, I, I was talking in my sleep. I would wake up in the middle of the night praying. I was like in the middle of, I thought I was dreaming while I was, it was crazy, man. And when I finally figured out it was strep throat, I'll tell you right now, I'll take COVID any day over strep. Especially now what COVID has become. I mean, it's now like a minor cold, but those things are good. It's our perversion and, and abuse of these things that make them bad. Sex is good. It's good when you're married. Married. When you're not married, sex is bad for you. It's how you end up with unwanted pregnancies. It's why the push of abortion is so strong right now. Because in the 60s and 70s, free sex. It was the sex movement. You know what happens when you start having sex with do dozens of people and everybody's just out having sex again? You know what comes after that? Unwanted pregnancies. You know how you deal with unwanted pre and disease? You know what comes with unwanted pregnancies? Abortion. It's the same worship in the days of Israel. They had the worship of the God called Baal and Asherah. It was the sex worship. That's how you worship Baal and Asherah. Asherot. You'd go have sex under these certain trees, these fertility gods. And when you do that, you get unwanted pregnancies. And when back then, though, they didn't abort the babies and their mom. They were way more humane than us. They would give birth to the baby first. And then they would take it to this iron god, this giant iron cow with arms that sat out like this. And its chest opens up. And they would stoke the fires of, of, Ash, of Molech. The, the god's name was Molech. Yeah. And they would stoke the fire so hot that the hands would turn bright. A bright color, like a, a burnished bronze, because it was so hot. And I'm just not ready for a baby, or my baby has a defect. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship Molech, and I'm going to offer my baby to Molech. And later on in life, when I'm more financially stable, and when maybe next time the baby's not defected, Molech will give me a better child. And you take this baby, this beautiful child, and you stick it on the burning hot hands of Molech. The baby starts screaming and you take a pitchfork and you push it into the belly. That was the worship and that was worship for thousands of years. We're way too humane for that. So we take these implements and we stick them inside the mother's vagina and we rip the baby up in her, in her womb and we pull the baby out piece by piece in there. We're way more humane than them, right? I'm here to tell you abortion is disgusting. If you've ever had an abortion, God will forgive you. But I'm here to tell you, it is murder. And it is still Molech worship. It's the, it's, the, it's the worship of I'm not ready. I'm not financially stable. My baby has a defect and the doctor said if we don't abort the baby, then 
Tim Tebow was supposed to be aborted because there was a defect in him and the doctor said, you'll never live. If you give birth to him, you're going to die and he'll never live for sure. And if he lives, he's going to be mentally retarded with all kinds of stuff. And Tim Tebow was a famous millionaire football player, announcer now and a born again believer and advocate against abortion. Sex is good in its proper place. Outside of what God made it to be, you're going to end up with diseases and unwanted pregnancies. Wait. Wait for marriage. Wait for marriage. That's how God intended it to be, and God will bless that. But he saw that everything was good that he created. And there was evening and there was morning, his sixth day. And with that, we end this. And next week, we pick up in verse or chapter 2. And we're going to see the seventh day, which really should have been in chapter one, but it's not. And when we see next week, we're going to see the camera pan and go like this. And it's going to retell everything that just happened from a different perspective. And we'll talk about that. Father, we thank you for being God. And we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace, for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you that you are the everlasting God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you for creation, Lord, and all that you have set before us. We thank you that you've given us the wisdom and the intelligence to be able to go over your word and to dissect this passage, Lord, and to know and be established and affirmed in the truth of your word. I pray that as we go out for the rest of this week, into this weekend that you would go before us to cause your face to shine upon us, to uphold us with your righteous right hand, and that your will would be done in our lives throughout this week. We bless you and we praise you, Lord, and we thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name, amen.